Folks, good evening. My name is Aziz Dewai, Professor of Communication and Digital Media Studies at Ontario Tech University. On behalf of the organizing committee, welcome and thank you for attending our latest installment of Beyond the Walls, an initiative jointly organized and uh, by the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech in partnership with the Oshawa Public Libraries. Before introducing today's talk, I would like to deliver our land acknowledgement. We are thankful to be welcome on, on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabeg nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out, out of respect for the indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. Most importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and the lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. With this holiday season upon us, I know many in my family and many of our friends will be binge watching on Hallmark movies. As many of us know, Hallmark movies are familiar, fun, and formulaic part of many people's holiday viewing habits. But did you know most of them are also Canadian? Hallmark movies don't seem that all that important, but as our speaker tonight, Dr. Andrea Braithwaite will illustrate, they play an important role in the economic health of Canada's media industries and might even suggest that our so-called Canadian taste in media is a little more Americanized than we might like to think. Our speaker, Dr. Andrea Braithwaite, will be sharing with us some of her provocative insights about the enduring popularity of Hallmark movies and the Canadian film industry. She will answer these related questions, and it is my great pleasure to introduce her as tonight's speaker. My longtime colleague, Andrea Braithwaite, is an associate teaching professor at Ontario Tech communica in Communication and Digital Media Studies. She holds a PhD in Communication Studies from McGill University. Her research looks at gender, crime, and detective stories across media, and especially in Canadian media. She is part of a cross-Canada research team examining re representations of crime in Canadian film and television. Andrea's other research interests include representations of crime, uh, representations of and responses to feminist activism in online and gaming communities. She teaches about topics like television, Canadian media, video games, tech history, and crime in pop culture. Before I yield the floor to Andrea, some housekeeping details are in order. Andrea's presentation will be followed by a Q&A, and we encourage members of the audience to keep their questions till the end of the presentation. You may ask your question through one of the following options. Use the um, hand icon, or just basically you can turn on your webcam and make uh, and pose your questions directly to the speaker. Or the other option is to write down your question in the chat bar and I or my colleagues here from the library uh, or Karen, Jen Clark or Karen will read the question to our uh, speaker. One final reminder, please make sure to keep yourself on mute during the presentation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrea Braithwaite. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aziz. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, to get us on the mood, I would like to start by sharing the trailer 
that I made for this event. begin by thanking the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, whose generous support makes this and other parts of my research possible. No, no, there we go. Uh, Hallmark is currently the reigning queen of made for TV movies. And this is a funny industry joke uh, because Hallmark is a subsidiary of Crown Media. And this might only be funny to me. Uh, so let's start with the reason for the season, Hallmark's popular Countdown to Christmas event. This year, and let me say that again, for the cheap seats, this year and this year alone, Hallmark released 40 new Christmas movies. 40, 40, just for Christmas. That doesn't include all of the other seasonal movies that Hallmark has turned into a thing. These include Winterfest, Valentine's, Spring Fever, a countdown to summer, which is somehow a different season than spring, uh, Summer Nights, June Weddings, and Fall Harvest. And in the increasingly small amount of off season, Hallmark still has you covered with its move into themed movie cycles, uh, movies set in wineries, movies about cooking competitions, movies where dogs meet and their people fall in love, ones with time travel, you know, girly things. There's also my personal favorite and how I got on this made for TV movie kick in the first place. Hallmark's mystery movies with lady detectives, which all have a very murder she wrote vibe in the sense that they all take place in very small towns with very high body counts. One of the things all these movies have in common is their structure. Decades ago, folklorist Joseph Campbell described what he called the monomyth or the hero's journey, a consistent set of story elements and plots he found in all sorts of folklore and fairy tales across time and cultures. We can still see these steps today in our pop culture and even in Hallmark movies, a heroine's journey, just with a different kind of ring to rule them all. In other words, a formula. Hallmark films are formulaic and predictable. So formulaic and predictable that there are drinking games for them to make your day merry and bright and just maybe not the next day. If you've seen one Hallmark movie, you've seen them all. City Girl finds herself in a small town somehow, and while she's there, she crosses paths with a hunky small town boy. It's all very don't stop believing. They spend time together, feelings happen, and <gasps> a miscommunication of some sort feels like it'll derail things before they even really begin. A wise force brings them back together and resolves the misunderstanding. There's the slow lean in to a short, chaste, close-mouthed kiss. Only racy Lifetime movies have open-mouthed kissing. And a quick cut to the credits. The happily ever after is implied. I was fortunate over the summer to attend an online workshop for aspiring Hallmark script writers. 
And they made no bones about how tightly structured their films are. Meeting these specific patterns and plot points is necessary if you want your script to even get looked at. It clearly works for them and, and for their audience. So the Hallmark movies are formulaic and predictable. But did you know they are also Canadian? Many of them are shot in BC, like lots of other American movies and TV shows, given the wonderful diversity of environments within easy driving distance of each other. Between federal funding bodies like Telefilm and provincial and regional supports, Canada's got a comprehensive system of tax breaks and grants for such projects, and a flexible definition of what counts as Canadian. This flexible definition is important for the CRTC, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, which comes up with and enforces the rules for all of Canada's broadcast media. It's the reason why Canadian TV channels and radio stations have Canadian content quotas, which requires channels to air a specific amount of Canadian stuff in order to keep their broadcast license. Importantly for our purposes here is how over the past few decades, this definition of Canadian content has shifted to prioritize economic and production oriented aspects of film and television. This means where something is filmed, where it's mixed and edited, ancillary services like catering and costuming and the talent, writers, directors and actors. Having Canadians in the cast shooting in Canada, using Canadian post-production services, all of this counts in establishing a film or TV series as Canadian, even if the story itself is set in one of the unbelievably plentiful small towns in the US with very festive names. This is how Hallmark films qualify as Canadian. So why is this interesting beyond being a fun fact for parties or trivia nights? Because the gap between the significant economic place these films have for the health of our creative industries and the very mockable place they hold in pop culture is a useful case study for the challenges that Canada's film industry grapples with both in the past and in the present. So on the one hand, we have a set of primarily economic and industry oriented rules that consider a movie to be Canadian based on how much work it generates for Canadians across all levels of the film industry. On the other hand, we have a long history of cultural policies with very different ideas of what a Canadian film looks like. And while there's usually still lots of snow, that's pretty much where the similarities to Hallmark films ends. Historically, ideas about Canadian film have been nationalistic. We've defined films as Canadian based on their stories being about Canadians doing Canadian things in Canadian places. Past definitions of Canadian film have operated with this kind of nebulous sense of Canadianness, but leaving exactly what that is up in the air. Canadianness is like pornography, apparently. We can't say what it is, but we know it when we see it. Along these lines, there's a recurring sense of Canadian film as not American. Part of where Canadian content regulations came from in the first place was an opposition to the popularity and market dominance of American media especially Hollywood. The Canadian content system wants to make sure there's room in Canada's media landscape for Canadian stories. So it's a bit nationalistic, asserting the importance of these stories, and it's a bit protectionist in wanting to stake out a space and maintain that space for Canadian stuff to be seen. And if we're being truly honest with ourselves, it's also a bit of superiority. The cheese factor and the formulaic structure of Hallmark films make them feel American. Their simple, easy stories fit for the mass American audience, but a little too 
basic to be Canadian. If this train of thought feels familiar, it's not just you. It's a grand Canadian tradition of talking about Hollywood as just entertainment. Hollywood makes movies. While Canada has films, thoughtful, meaningful works of art. We can trace this attitude back to the landmark 1950s Massey Report, a comprehensive assessment of the arts in Canada at the time. And it's here that we can find this rhetoric of Canadian superiority when it comes to our taste in entertainment. For example, the report charges American media with having inferior cultural standards and describes it as noisy, uninformed clamor. This is some excellent shade by some uppity white dudes. Of course, this stereotype of American media as uninformed noise and Canadian media as culturally superior doesn't hold up today. Frankly, it didn't really hold up in the 50s either. And the Massey Report is in many ways a statement of ideals and not the reality of Canada's, Canadians' media habits. This is evident in the ongoing, the even overwhelming popularity of American media in most Canadian households, including Hallmark movies. While, I mean, while we may think we're somehow above Hallmark movies, that we're only watching them ironically from our superior vantage point, that doesn't change the fact that we're still watching them. Hallmark is still getting our attention and enough of our attention for them to justify making more and more movies every year, 40. Which brings us around to the thorny question of if Hallmark movies are so popular and if Hallmark movies are Canadian and if Hallmark movies are a part of today's film industry, why is there no Hallmark channel in Canada? We can look to the CRTC to get some ideas about this too, because another way the CRTC tries to keep space for Canadian content is by deciding which channels get to operate here and Canadian channels get first dibs. An American network isn't likely to get approved unless it can demonstrate that it would provide something no other Canadian channel could. So with this in mind, here are my 100% speculative guesses why Hallmark is holding off on pitching a Hallmark Canada channel. A, Canadians are cutting the cord and going streaming only much more aggressively than Americans are. And Hallmark's online presence is minimal and kind of crappy. B, Hallmark's brand skews Christian and conservative which in practice manifests as an obvious preference for stories about straight white people. This doesn't line up with the expectations the CRTC places on all Canadian broadcasters to provide programming that reflects Canada's diversity. Amusingly, Crown Media CEO Bill Abbott has tried to point the finger at Canada for Hallmark's movie's whiteness, arguing that shooting here limits their casting options. A claim made all the more ridiculous when most of these movies are shot near the GTA or Vancouver, home to the most diverse populations in the country. However, the past year and a bit has seen Hallmark make surprising, for Hallmark, expansions in its casting, a same-sex marriage subplot in one of its June wedding movies, and a kind of ham-fisted attempt at recognizing that people celebrate things other than Christmas. If this keeps up, this point of mine might be happily moot. And C. Two years ago, Hallmark signed what was no doubt a lucrative deal with the W Network to make it the sole Canadian channel carrying Hallmark stuff. It's a win for the W Network since these movies are a big draw for its target audience and they're Canadian to boot, so hooray, CanCon quotas are met. And it's a win for Hallmark, which gets to prime a new market, gauge the appetite for its products here, and make money off movies they've already finished, 
without having to do any market research or deal with running a network in an unfamiliar regulatory environment. But where exactly does this leave Canadian audiences thirsting for all the hallmark stuff as soon as possible? For the time being, we are resigning ourselves to their delayed broadcast on W or scouring the shady back alleys of the internet for not entirely legal versions. No matter, for we can clearly see the importance of Hallmark movies to Canada's film industry and to Canadian audiences. They create lots of opportunities for creative types looking to break into the biz and lots of work for the livers of couch types enjoying them at home. It looks like Hallmark is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. This is really a great talk and a uh, great topic to many of us who study the media, but I think also from, uh, for people from other disciplines who are interested in the cultural industries. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking here at the questions. This is really um, an opportunity, not for me and you to interact, although this is a topic of great interest to us, but for the audience to engage um, with, uh, with the talk and ask you any questions. So please feel free if you have any questions. If not, um, I know uh, Hannah Scott was raising um, the issue of Hallmark movies being um, shown um, uh, on The Simpsons last night. I don't know I, uh, like what was the context, but if Hannah is here, I would invite her to deliver that in the form of a question. I'm putting you on the spot, my friend. Okay, so I don't know how many of you were around last night watching The Simpsons. It was a brand new Simpsons and it was about Hallmark movies. It was absolutely delightful. Um, it was, the subplot was a woman who was uh, um, bucking for promotion and she had done the mystery movie uh, Hallmark versions, and she had to correct uh, this one Christmas movie that was being shot in Springfield. But it was absolutely delightful. One of the things they did was actually show how how the the director, the the, the person who played the director uh, or voiced the director, um, talked about was how nothing really mattered; that the plots were always the same. And so I'm wondering, um, you kind of answered this in your presentation to suggest that when you went to this writer's meeting that there actually is, is a very um, stalwart kind of <laughs> plot to these Hallmark movies. Is it the same for both the Christmas movies and then also the mystery movies and all the other genres that they have? It is. This was one of the questions that I asked and some of the other participants and like half the participants were from Canada. So, so there are a bunch of aspiring Canadian Hallmark screenwriters. We are not alone here. Um, and yes, this was something that when they were rolling out their very clear chart of nine minutes in, you do this, 11 minutes, this happens. Uh, there was this question of, okay, but but what about like the murder mysteries? And they're like, oh, it's the same thing, except at some point someone dies, right? And so there's still this emphasis on, on the structure being what they see as, as very intrinsically tied into their brand. And then all the rest of it is more like set dressing, right? So, and yeah, I found that really, really fascinating. Can I ask one more question? Please go ahead. I noticed there's a link between like these Hallmark movies and I'm gonna put you on the spot, Andrea. And, and a friend of mine had actually gone to do romance novels. And in romance novels, especially in Harlequin romances, he had gone, it was a man, <laughs> he was writing for this audience and he had gone to one of these and they had a very similar markup. Does Hallmark and these romance novels, are they connected somehow? Like, it seems to me like they should be. They should be, they're not. Um, I mean, part of what Hallmark has done, especially with its murder mysteries is most of its murder mysteries are adaptations of mass market fiction. Whereas in their other sort of theme stuff, 
um, it works the other way around, right? So we see Hallmark movies getting novelized and you can buy the novelization of like a Christmas in wherever, a Christmas in Christmas town, right? So they will turn it into books, but the mystery movies are movie versions usually of a, a book franchise. So, but otherwise, otherwise, this is another thing at this fascinating workshop. They are usually pretty reluctant to adapt books because they want to have very firm control over what the stories are and how they get told. To the point that if you pitch them an idea and they like it, but they don't like working with you, they, they keep your idea and they hand it off to somebody who will be like, I don't care about my creative vision. I just want to follow these steps and get my paycheck, so. Thank you very much, Andrea. I don't know if you're following the chat, but there is lots of interaction Questions uh, and snow. comments. And <laughs> we do have a question. And I think this question relates to the creative side uh, and the production side of Hallmark movies by um, one of our participants here, El Prez, El Presidente. Uh, just completed from. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the question, and I'm reading it here for you, it says, as it is shot in Canada, why don't they use real snow? Is it just money? Do they not realize how false it looks? Um, a few reasons. One of the reasons is they shoot these puppies year round. So for a lot of their shooting season, there isn't all that much real snow to use. Uh, especially when they're shooting in BC, um, which doesn't get the same amounts of snow as there is in the movies. Uh, what they do in BC often is they actually like, they go and they take the stuff from like the ice from down at the docks and sort of shave it up and then use it there. And when I was looking through pictures on Hallmark's website uh, for the trailer and one of my favorites was the one where they've clearly just shoved sheets inside of other sheets and made that look like a snowman, right? So, so I think they realize that it looks false, but it's a matter of kind of expediency over realism. So okay. because if it was real snow, they would take off their boots when they enter someone's house. They never do, it drives me crazy. <laughs> um, thanks, Andrea. Uh, as I said here to our audience, there are so many good resources and links to other um, kind of uh, useful content regarding Hallmark movies. But uh, I'm just going to move to the next question here by Eric Allen, who writes, great job, Dr. B. Loved your presentation style. So you're getting some comments here, um, uh, positive feedback. And uh, the question is, whether Hallmark operates on a TV season production schedule or more like traditional movie productions, so. One of the things that is astounding about Hallmark films is that once the cameras start rolling, they're done in under three weeks. Like it is just hardcore, wow. nonstop, like just go, 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 right? So. So this is, part of, this is part of how they managed to churn out like 40 for Christmas and then wow. a whole bunch of other ones for all of these other fake seasons that they've come up with is they have, I, part of the formula is not just in the story but in their approach to production. And so they have all of this incredibly tightly regimented as well. So, so it doesn't take like the year, two years, three years that we see for big budget films. Like it really is just sort of in and out. And then the actors grab a script and, you know, go like one town over and start up all over again. And it's really, it's remarkable how much they get done in like two or three weeks. Yeah. Um, and I do appreciate the formulaic kind of uh, nature of these Hallmark movies and um, and how that contributes to the fast-paced production. Uh, the next question actually veers from, uh, from this, from the production to commenting about the diversity um, in Hallmark movies. And this is a good question. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's Caitlin Gambier, oh, or she 
rights. Uh, what's the reasoning behind the, behind why they won't rapidly increase diversity? She, uh, I'm, I'm reading here. I've also found that interest that interesting about uh, about these movies, the lack of diversity. So, could you comment I, on that? Yeah, this is. I think this is where we see one of those differences between what us media studies folks call like the imagined audience. Yep. So what a media corporation or a content producer thinks their audience is or wants it to be and, and the actual audience, people who sit down and tune in, right? And I think Hallmark has historically relied very heavily on what it imagines its audience to be or wants its audience to be rather than what its audience actually is because because obviously if they look at who's actually watching hallmark movies for whatever reasons mm -hmm. it's it's much more diverse and i think especially especially over the past say four and a bit years along with other sorts of massive american events um the really steep rise in Hallmark movie popularity has made Hallmark realize they only have stuff to gain from very slowly changing okay. how how they cast and and the kinds of the kinds of people that get to fall in love in these films. So very good. Um, and I second Amanda Robinson's comment here about the astounding number of movies 40 new christmas movies this year that's that's really an astounding number it takes lots of financial capital and also lots of uh, uh production kind of uh have to 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 deliver that um the next question that i have is from carolyn howard as someone who grew up in vancouver she writes um and got to see many films being shot and got to see lots of snow during the summer months due to, the, to production. What are your thoughts about a community's perception of itself when it spends the majority of the year pretending to be somewhere else? This is a really fascinating question. I, I there's actually been some stuff done about this with Vancouver and Victoria specifically because of how popular they are as, as shooting destinations for all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and there are a whole bunch of different ideas about what this means for a city to to see slightly modified versions of itself on television where it's not actually itself anymore. And part of what I find so interesting about this is it's kind of like a, a scaled down version of, of how Canada operates as this kind of the Hollywood North in general, right? And this game that we all play watching American television shows and American movies and being like, oh, that's Vancouver, that's Toronto, that's, that's Pontypool. And and being able to play like spot the Canada inside of America. And I think it, it gets us back to that longstanding sort of anxiety in Canadian media about what does it mean to have our media system so dominated by another country's media system? And how, how do we tell stories about ourselves to ourselves when so much of of the narratives around us aren't ours. So yeah, I don't think that actually answers your question, but but your question opens up onto like an entire, well, an entire course worth of material that I'm so I start teaching next month, so. Yeah, and also I, um, I heard you kind of allude to this kind of complex relationship between America and Canada and probably cultural imperialism kind of scholars would have lots to say. Um, I, I don't I, I want to stop editorializing and go quickly into the questions because we're having lots of questions here. Uh, one from Leslie Hopkins. Um, the question states, they turn out the movies so quickly. Do you know how long it takes to shoot one movie? 
Sorry, yeah. I, I was listening. She, she answered. She knew my question before you asked it. I okay. I've done that before. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, I just wanted to make sure that, we are, uh, that I acknowledge the question. So uh, Hannah Scott, uh, H. Scott, and I'm not assuming it's Hannah, but uh, the question is, we have had four or five Hallmark movies in the last few years shot in Fort Perry. So that's Hannah Scott in the last year. We have a lot of fake snow on our buildings. They have closed due to, uh, to COVID, but are looking to resume. So is Hallmark being challenged by COVID? Um, to the best of my knowledge, as somebody who follows news releases for Hallmark, um, <laughs> they have uh, restarted shooting. Restarted actually. Um, so, so they don't anticipate having as many movies next year as they had ready to go for this year, but, but they are back primarily in BC right now and some in Toronto as Canada's two biggest places that also have the sort of most resources to do this. And, and they have very particular ways in which they are changing their storylines to mm -hmm. maintain particular kinds of physical distancing guidelines. And I saw further down, I'm going to preempt or early answer somebody's question that what I have read is that they are already working on some Hallmark COVID-19 style storylines wow. in which it's like love in the times of masks or <laughs> something like that. So, so Hallmark being very opportunistic in that sense mm -hmm. is, and I mean, it makes sense, right? If masks are an important sort of public health initiative, then put all your actors in masks and then you can still keep shooting, right? So, yeah. Um, and this question is from Carolyn McGregor, who writes, given the revenue that they want to generate, it is surprising that Hallmark does not seem to participate in much uh, or to participate much in product placement activities in their movies. Is that correct? They do. It's just all of the products are their own products, right? Okay. And this is especially noticeable in well on the Hallmark Channel proper, like in the U.S. and on their websites. And like I didn't make up those those bottles of wine with Hallmark labels. Hallmark has released its own holiday wine for you to drink while watching its holiday movies. And, and so their product placement is their own stuff. So a lot of the decorations and like the tchotchkes and all of that kind of stuff that gets prominent place in the Christmas films especially, you can then go to Hallmark stores in the US and purchase as like commemorative ornaments from watching Merry Christmas in Christmas Town. And, and getting like those specific things. So this is the way that they are doing product placement is essentially by making it this kind of perpetual machine for their own sort of body of branded products. Yeah. Uh, the next question takes us back to the topic of snow rather than product placement and economics of Hallmark movies. So uh, it's by Charlotte Bedard. Staying on the topic of snow, she writes, uh, I know that in some towns of Northern Ontario uh, are in dispute with Hallmark on the environmental factors of the fake snow. Do you know if they plan to adapt their formula of making the snow to work with the climate change laws in Canada? I don't know anything about that, but that is really mm -hmm. interesting. It would not surprise me if they did make those changes. They have become so reliant on Canada as their own kind of soundstage for stuff like this, that, that I could see them taking steps that they need to, to keep working with these communities and at the same time hit these kinds of targets. But I, in, in the particulars, I'm not aware of anything specific. So. Yeah. Uh, for those who are from Ontario Tech, they are we are familiar with ACE, the ACE facility, and Caroline McGregor is suggesting that probably we need to come up with a storyline that will bring Hallmark to film at Ontario Tech and in ACE in particular. Yeah. 
Um, you will write this. <laughs> okay, um, excellent. Uh, Shanti, Shanti has, has a question, so I'm reading her question. Lifetime is more quote unquote diverse. Are they doing this to compete with traditional Hallmark uh, or to distinguish themselves from traditional Hallmark movies? Part of what I find really interesting about the Hallmark movies versus Lifetime movies is, is Lifetime movies are much more made for TV movie whereas Hallmark movies are very clearly Hallmark movies, right? And so Lifetime is also the network where you find those made for TV movies of like, help, my daughter's a cheerleader and I slept with the captain of the football team and then they killed me, <laughs> right? Like that's where you find these sort of high melodrama. Lifetime is where they remade that V.C. Andrews story. Oh, the sort of incesty one, what was it called? Somebody, flowers in the attic yes thank you leslie yes <laughs> right so like lifetime took on flowers in the attic and it is absolutely the more sort of risque and in the more traditional sort of history of made for tv movies being kind of over the top dramatic right and so this i think is how lifetime is trying to set itself up as distinct from so when for a while there, they were the, the Christmas movies that had redheads, right? <laughs> well, the, I saw one with somebody in a wheelchair the other day, that Christmas Ever After. Yeah. Yes. So they have, they have, and sometimes they're trying to do everything and sort of like, okay, we're going to have, uh, dis, we're going to have disability. We're going to have gay. We're going to have black. We're going to, we're going to do it all. Yeah. It's still so, Yeah. Um, excellent. The next question by Ilprez. Uh, so how many production crews in operation per year? Uh, what is the dollar turnover for Hallmark uh, per year? And who are the real owners? So I, I guess it's about the economics and- corporate. Yeah, um, I don't know um, hard numbers about how many production crews. Hallmark very close mouthed about the sort of ins and outs of, of its operation. Um, lots is <laughs> a non-specific sort of ballpark answer um, because they, they always have multiple projects on the go. And so what I've been able to gather is that they just have sort of set teams that they move from project to project to project to project. And this is part of how they can put these things out so quickly because these teams, like they've developed that rhythm of being able to work with each other. So Hallmark does very well financially. Um, over the past 10 years, we have seen most television networks really struggle to, to stay afloat in an age where people are switching to streaming services and so on and so forth. And Hallmark is one of two networks that actually expanded. So there used to be just the Hallmark Channel, and now there's the Hallmark Channel and Hallmark Movies and Mysteries as its own channel. Um, the only other networks that are doing anywhere near Hallmark's business are sports networks. So, so they, they are thriving in an age where most quote unquote traditional television is really struggling. And so their numbers are very good compared to other television networks. And Hallmark is owned by a big ass conglomerate called Crown Media that owns Hallmark Media and all of Hallmark's like, like chain stores, retail stores, and a couple other uh, media production companies and that sort of thing, so. Okay, thank you so much. Angelique Dack, uh, Dack's question is, is there a way in which Hallmark can pivot to be more in line with society's values in 2020? Yeah, I think, I think they're trying. I think they have finally realized this is sort of the point of no return. And, and the stuff just this past year of having, well, having a mixed race couple in one of their Christmas movies, which is very unusual for Hallmark. Um, having, black leads in a film where it's not just because they're in a town that seems to consist of only black people, which has been the way they have approached this up until now. Um, and, and 
they now have two movies that I'm aware of, one from the summer and one Christmas movie that have same sex couples. So they are taking these little steps. And I think, I think them cutting off one of their sponsors because their sponsor made a, a same sex themed commercial and the massive outrage that generated, I think was a wake up call for Hallmark about just how big and diverse their audience is. And I think that was the point at which, as you say, they, they are starting to pivot, okay. but just in little conservative baby steps. Yeah. And do you predict, this, is, this goes to the other points we talked about COVID and adaptation of these movies to the, COVID, to the pandemic. Um, so do you predict a COVID Hallmark movie in the future? I think you already answered that question. Uh, I'm just going to skip to another question, which is um, I, Hannah Scott. Who is the crown group you mentioned that you thought was funny? Can you talk about who owns Hallmark ownership? I think you did touch on that indirectly, but it bears kind of uh, repeating. Yeah, Crown Media is just one of these big sort of horizontally and vertically integrated media companies, meaning that they own both the way to distribute their stuff. So they own networks on which to show their own content and they also own the means of production. So they own like the studios to shoot their stuff and production teams to get this stuff mixed and edited. So yeah, so Crown Media is, it's a, a fairly respectably sized media production corporation, so. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Andrea, for great, your, your great answers. We don't have much time, but uh, I think we can squeeze three more questions. And this one uh, goes to the competition. Uh, but Carolyn Howard asks, do you think that the, more, that the more diverse holiday offerings coming out from Netflix and Prime are putting pressure on Hallmark or is Hallmark too big to fail or care? I think you are absolutely right, Carolyn. I, Netflix is the first place in a long time. And if that has paid attention to making rom-coms and that has paid attention to making cheesy holiday movies. And Netflix obviously has, has the capability to take this on without worrying too much whether or not it's gonna impact their bottom line. And that their forays into these media forms were really well received. And so I think this made Hallmark sort of pause and be like, okay, well, Netflix is here to stay. And if they are going to move into this and they are already in so many homes, then, then we need to you know, step up our own game a little, so. And you also, you already touched on this indirectly, but it, again, it's really an important question um, and it relates to the Canadian media film industry. So um, El Prez asks, why are they so dependent on Canada? Why not produce in the US, Mexico, or is it just tax breaks question? It is just tax breaks. We have phenomenal tax breaks. Well, so a large part of it is tax breaks. Um, and some of it honestly is Canada has an incredibly large and very skilled workforce when it comes to film and television. So not only for like domestic production, but because so much stuff is shot here, you can find really talented Canadians at all levels of the film industry because there, there is so much work available. And so, yeah, some of it's the tax breaks and some of it is knowing you are going to get like really top end um, labor that, that knows what they're doing, so. Okay, very good. Uh, the next question that we're going to squeeze in is by Peter who thanks, uh, who wrote, thanks Andrea, I readily confess to having led a Hallmark less life without regret, but interested in how Hallmark portrays poverty in its films, if at all, I would, uh, that's my own uh, uh, addition. Does it factor into the fairy tales motif as an obstacle to be overcome? It is the subject of, uh, it is the subject of systemic pity or is it just not part of the apolitical bubble in which events unfold? or something else? 
Yeah, so when we were thinking about poverty in Hallmark films as part of the storyline, we, I can't think of many Christmas movies, especially in the past few years where that's come up because it's kind of a downer and their Christmas movies are just relentlessly optimistic. Um, it shows up a lot in the mystery movies and always has this sort of gotcha because there's always this moment where the heroine's like, I bet the poor guy did it. And of course they didn't. And then she's like, I was wrong for judging someone for being poor. And it's a kind of learn and grow moment in that sense. Um, but for like actual explorations of the impact of poverty, that, <laughs> that's like lifetimes deal, you know? So where lifetime is all like the, the more melodramatic stuff we find more thoughtful explorations of class beyond like the surprise I'm a prince um, in lifetime stuff and not homework. So. Let me pause for a minute and ask Jen Clark, do we have enough time for the final kind of uh, part of, to, of the event or should I just kind of yeah, uh, I... read uh, one or two questions? Oh, we could go ahead with the last couple questions. I'll only need about 30 seconds at the very end. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you. So next question is from uh, Cass Golding. What about Netflix holiday romantic comedy movies? They are not Lifetime or Hallmark, but they are so similar. Do you think ne Netflix is attempting to compete with Hallmark? I do. I really do. I think, and I think Netflix is pretty confident that it probably won't steal any of Hallmark's own audience, but I think Netflix is betting on this being a way to get new audiences, especially in the other regions beyond the US where it operates, where Hallmark doesn't have any dedicated services. So this is a way for you to like get that cheesy holiday movie fix without having to like go online and be like, oh my God, where do I find the Hallmark movies? Because, because you can get them on Netflix and Netflix is much more international in its mm -hmm. scope than Hallmark is. Excellent. Um, the next question is by Charlotte Bidard. Uh, being that Canadians are cable cutters way faster than Americans, do you think that Hallmark app will be able to come to Canada being that there is a ton of CanCon content, I'm assuming, in their production content to please the CRTC. So it's a question about regulation of the content here. Yeah, this, I need to have a very well-informed answer about this part because, because apps are, are still, Canada's regulatory apparatuses are still figuring out exactly how to deal with apps that offer content when it comes to stuff like this, right? So we've seen this with apps for other American channels and we can install them, but then you go to launch them and watch something like on Comedy Central and we're sorry, this video is unavailable in your location, right? So, so part of why Hallmark is possibly holding off on this is because, because the rules around this are still so murky because Canada is not as on the ball in terms of regulating apps that I think they're probably just holding off and sort of getting money from other places because I know you can get them through the W Networks app, so. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. I think I, uh, I've read all the questions. There are some interesting comments and interesting tips about the Hallmark movie industry. We thought I'd come to uh, I will turn the, the floor to Jen Clark to share with us some important resources. And thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you everyone um, uh, for attending. Oh yeah, absolutely, thank you. All right, thank you, Andrea. A fascinating talk and discussion after, that was wonderful. Um, so I'm just gonna talk here about what the library has to offer you in the way of Hallmark. So the library offers a variety of Hallmark titles to keep you entertained, 
If you're looking for something to read, I recommend checking out the library's ebook titles on our cloud library platform. There you can find the latest heartwarming Christmas stories to read as you stay home this holiday season. But there's so much more than just Christmas books to be discovered. There are companion novels to beloved Hallmark movies and brand new novels to brighten your day and leave you feeling good about life. With the same attention to storytelling that goes into every Hallmark movie, these stories bring you new characters, relationships, romances, and intriguing mysteries. And each book includes an original recipe inspired by the story. If you prefer your Hallmark on screen, though, I'm pleased to tell you the library carries a large selection of Hallmark movies. Every year we order some of the new Hallmark Christmas movies, not all 40, mind you, each year, but we do order a bunch. Uh, so if you come back year after year, you'll always find something new to watch during the holidays. We also carry the latest seasons of Hallmark's popular TV shows, The Good Witch and Chesapeake Shores. For all these and more, all you need is a library card and visit our website at oshlib.ca. And stay tuned to the library's website for the next lineup of speakers starting in January with our Beyond the Wall series. So once again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Andrea, for a wonderful presentation. And Aziz, thank you for your wonderful moderating this evening and what a great discussion we had. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.